All right, what's up? What's up, internet? What's up, world? This is uh, your host, Cian, uh, Cian the Bitman. <laughs> and? Money making Matthew. <laughs> yeah. And we're the blockchainers uh, coming at you from the heart of Seoul, Korea, uh, bringing you all that goodness about blockchain cryptocurrency, news, interviews. We got what you need. So uh, today, today on the blockchainers hot seat, we have a very special guest. Um, he is, as Grace and Manilov puts it, the greatest player of all time. Please intru introduce yourself, the greatest player of all time. Hey guys, it's good to be here. I'm Matt Spoke from uh, from the Aeon Project. I'm uh, dialing in from Toronto, Canada. Uh, happy to be here. It's good to see you guys again. Uh, seems like your reputation precedes you. I mean, what what kind of things have you done at all these like different conferences, Matthew? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we've been spending a lot of time over the last few months um, just getting around. We're trying to spread the word. So I've been traveling a lot, going to different cities and countries, talking about what we're working on. Obviously, back home, the team's kind of developing and getting the first releases of our roadmap out the door. We're launching Testnet goes out today, um, which is pretty exciting for us, big, big milestone. Um, so we've got a lot more coming up over the next six months. We're just doing a lot of conferences and meetups. So now when we go to cities, not only doing like conferences and speaking, but then we're also trying to host like community meetups. So that we get a chance to talk to people and like get feedback and, um, you know, spend more and more time with developers because we're really trying to shift the conversation towards like the tech rather than the coin, uh, which is a, you know, big transition for us. Yeah, so let, let's talk about that a little bit. Like, I think all the projects, one of the projects, uh, one of the problems that they'll face soon enough uh, once the marketing hype dies down is how are you going to have a healthy ecosystem of developers and how do you have the healthy ecosystem of developers like continually flowing into into the particular projects? How, how, what have you guys planned for that? I think the big like the big thing this year is like making sure that you're actually delivering on the promises of your roadmap, right? So there's a lot of projects that had like really ambitious roadmaps, us included, and now now there's going to be like objective measures of did, were you able to build it? Right? It's a challenge. Like we're going through this daily. We're trying to hire a lot of people really quickly and train them as quickly as we can. But it's not you know it's not that obvious because it's it's really complicated problems. Um, so that's going to be a big differentiator between projects this year is, you know, who's actually living up to the expectation. Um, in terms of attracting developers, I mean, the good thing is that developers just get attracted to, they get attracted to cool new ideas. So I think if you're, if you're, if you're being genuine about what you're building and you're actually delivering, uh, we'll, there'll be like organic adoption and, and following just because people are, are curious. Um, you know, that said, we are doing a lot more meetups. Like I said, we're going to be doing a lot more developer events. Uh, you know, we may do some hackathons this year. We'll see. Uh, we're hosting the first like Aeon focused kind of full day conference, um, all focused on talking about our research, talking about our, our tech. And then increasingly, we're getting a lot of projects that are, are asking us if they can build stuff on top of the Aeon protocol. So we'll be working with some third party projects and companies that are launching their own apps or launching their own tools um, on top of our network. So, you know, that'll kind of kickstart that, which is, which is pretty helpful. And then, you know, we've maintained a pretty good, um, balance of tokens to use to like incentivize the community to pick up what we're doing. So we'll have code bounty programs and, and, you know, DAP development pro, uh, bounties. And if people can build visualization tools on the network, we'll have like a, a mechanism to like continuously reward them for doing that. So we can keep attracting people's attention. Uh, based on the interview you had, um, I, I heard that Iron Team has very unique vision and very unique, you know, process for hiring the developers. Could you describe the person you uh, want to, you know, hire? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we. Um, I think our <laughs> this is like part of the fun and part of the challenge has been like we're we're trying to keep our quality expectations really high when we hire people. Uh, so most of our engineers, you know, they come through a process of probably four, four or five steps by the time we hire them, including like a pretty in-depth, like full day technical challenge that they're like in the office coding uh, some sort of challenge that we put in front of them so that we can see the quality of their work when they join us. But there is like this expectation that they're starting for the most part, they're starting with very little background in the blockchain space. So that means we have to train them on a whole bunch of new concepts. So it might be engineers that have done, you know, work at, at the operating system level in different contexts, you know, building, on top of you know building VMs and compilers and um, but not necessarily worked directly in a blockchain environment. So there is some learning curve. 
Uh, so that means that although you know we'd love to quadruple the size of the team in a month, we know that it, it you, you kind of have to grow according to a plan because if you grow too quickly, there's not enough people there to train the new people and then we end up just becoming unproductive. So um, we do have a big focus on, on that quality. Now we've got kind of two parts of our, our development team. The one that's focused really on our on our kernel, you know, the, 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 the core of the operating system. So this is everything from like the peer-to-peer -peer protocol to the consensus algorithm, to the VM, to our bridge design. Um, and then we've got uh, anything that's kind of building tools and you know applications on top of that kernel so we've got some projects that we're working with that are in the process of building their own apps potentially going to run their own icos on top of aon uh, and then we've got tools that are necessary for any one of these ecosystems you know things like wallets and explorers and dashboards and that type of thing uh, so depending on what type of skill set the developers come to us with they end up falling into one of these two teams uh, generally and obviously around that there's you know qa and you know, unit user acceptance testing that type of thing but yeah, in, an, in another interview, you said uh, it's quite challenging to be uh, where you are and uh, trying to hire developers because <laughs> Toronto is well known for um, it being an AI city and you have to compete. The blockchain space has to compete with like the AI space in order to get the talent. How's that working out? Yeah, Toronto's. Um, I, I think it's a great city to be building a company, but it definitely is. You know, it has some limiting factors, and and not just because of Toronto, but because this is just the reality of building in a single place in a single city. You're always going to run into the constraints of how many people are on the market. Toronto happens to be a big hub for AI, which is great. It also happens to have a lot of big offices of a lot of U.S. tech companies. So the, you know, there's a big Google office and the Amazon office and a Facebook office that sucks up a lot of engineering talent out of our out of our top schools. Um, so, you know, we're, we're obviously like, it's in, it's very interesting problem right now for engineers that are curious about cryptocurrencies that they're, you know, more and more, we're naturally getting people interested because they hear about it. They're starting to trade, they're starting to buy ether and Bitcoin. Uh, so they want to get involved. They want to apply to a kind of newer crypto company. So we're getting better at that. Um, the second thing though, is we're just looking at how do we grow outside of Toronto? So we're this, this year we're going to be developing teams in other cities around the world to kind of augment what we're doing here. So we'll have like a, a part of our core team in Toronto, but we'll also end up having a part of our core team likely in Europe and in Asia. We're still working on some options in terms of what cities we'd place those teams in. Um, but, you know, we can't grow this to the scale we need it in a single city. So we're going to end up having like parts of the team a little bit uh, in a few different places. Okay, I know this is a horrible way to conduct an interview because our questions will be kind of all over the place. But right. can you, like, because we did, like, you talked about like we assume that the listeners know exactly what Aeon is. So uh, because because a lot of our listener, I think, are actually like the semi semi technical crowd who sure. they'll actually they'll probably most likely they'll have an idea of what Aeon is. You could go look up the white paper, go to their Reddit or and whatnot. But um, can you kind of tell us um, just? The, a high level, high level summary of what Aeon project is and like your kind of elevator pitch that you'll make to aspiring developers for Aeon? Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, high, high level pitch is, you know, we focused on, we're focusing on a, on a problem in the market that we think is not super evident yet, but that will become very critical. And that's the problem of multiple blockchains communicating with each other. And so right now we, we live in like the early, early stages of an industry where we can get away with you know, poor performance and poor scale and low transaction throughput. And all these things is not the end of the world because there's not very many people using cryptocurrencies. But you know, we're trying to envision what does the future look like when the world is using this technology. So then at that stage, you know, the big layer of infrastructure that we focus on is how do you scale across multiple blockchains? Um, and that means being able to build these communication protocols that move value and data uh, and information between blockchains. So uh, if you wanted to go build a solution or, or an application today, you're building it on top of like a single network. You're building it on top of Ethereum or on top of quantum or whatever. You know, we want to get to the point where building apps in this in this environment is not, you're not restricted to a single network where you can have a token that moves from one network to another. You can have a logic that moves from one network to another. Um, and you just open it up a lot more for like the creativity of like app developers and whether they be app developers in the enterprise market that are working on like, you know, business process transformation or app developers that are just trying to build some sort of new cool business model. Um, in, in both cases, we think that this layer of interoperability is going to be a big obstacle. And, you know, more and more, we're seeing that there's quite a few projects that kind of followed us into this space uh, as like a 
you know, focus because they realize that there is a big gap here. Um, so we're pretty optimistic that this is going to become an important layer. And now there's just a couple of different approaches on how do you solve it. Um, so, you know, we're trying to make sure that we maintain compatibility at the, at the app layer for our first release. It'll be completely compatible with like Solidity programs that would run on top of Ethereum that you can move over to the Aeon network. Uh, but more and more, we want to we want to get people thinking about where do our bridges fit into their app designs. So why would you want to build an application that ties into two different blockchains or three or more different blockchains? And how do you build that concept directly in your application is kind of our long-term thinking. Yeah, I had a question. So like one of the things that you mentioned is like the, um, the possibility that is unlocked by building on the Aeon One blockchain, right? Because sure. Aeon One blockchain offers you so many uh, avenues into the into all the different bridges and um, the different functions that can you you know you can tap into all the different blockchain ecosystem when you're build, building a truly decentralized application. Um, so, is that like do you see Aeon One project being like? the the place to go to to start building dApps or do you see people building dApps like can they can they kind of do what you um what you talk about with um like dApps that are dApps that use the functionality of multiple blockchains but it doesn't necessarily have to be on the Aeon one blockchain it could just be somewhere yeah, else yeah i think both are possible i mean um so we've got kind of two types of projects that we're talking to today uh one that's looking to build something directly on Aeon one so they're looking for like a starting point and they're saying, hey, I'm gonna build my public my public application on top of this network. And then the other type of project we're talking to is projects that already have applications built on Ethereum that are looking at how do you use this concept to be able to kind of open up multiple blockchains. Um, you know, where I could have an application that's already built on Ethereum, but I wanna like expand its reach to more and more networks. Uh, so that would be kind of the other way to look at it. So, we, you know, we're completely, it doesn't really matter to us. We're just trying to open up the idea in people's minds that when you build applications, you don't need to think about it as like, I can only build applications for users of one network. I can build applications for users of any network at some point. Obviously, there's a lot of work that needs to get done to get there. Like we need to build bridges that connect all of these networks to each other. And Aeon is the way that we're you know, intending to do that. Uh, but then after those bridges are in place, then all of a sudden I can build an app that has that's accessible to users of different networks rather than only an app that's accessible to users, users of one network. Because right now, if you want to become a user of an app, you have to convert into that coin to use the app. You know, And so we want to remove that step. So you want to use an app on Ethereum. You don't need to convert Bitcoin into Ethereum to use the app on Ethereum. You can go directly. Um, that's kind of the, the long-term goal. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to get put in place. I mean, we're building with our first release. We're also in the process of, of building our first bridge. And our first bridge is like Aeon to Ethereum. So you can start to have apps that are kind of native on both of those networks at the same time. Um, and, you know, we want to start demonstrating what that looks like as well. Some of the audience might wonder what bridge is. And I think that the core, you know, one of the core components for the Aeon is a bridge. How did you uh, think about like bridge and could you explain the bridge? and sure. how these bridge will bring the value to the ION networks. Sure, yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you're familiar with, um, with the industry, you've probably heard the term Oracle. And then we started thinking about, um, so Oracles were designed and they're still being worked on some cool companies like smartcontract.com, uh, working on Chainlink and, and Oracleize. Um, they're working on this concept of how do you pull data into a blockchain? And, and as you pull it into a blockchain, how do you make sure that it's valid and authentic? Generally, those designs were ba were focused on pulling data from non-blockchains into blockchains. So you're pulling it from a database or some sort of off-chain uh, system. Um, so we, we kind of looked at it the same way. We said, hey, a bridge is essentially how do you create a decentralized um, oracle that pulls proofs or data from one blockchain into another blockchain? So from you know when you see kind of the intersection of two blockchain networks, um, you need a way to validate that something happened on the other side. So something happened on the other blockchain. You can't rely on a single party to do that because then that party becomes vulnerable, right? They become the point that you might hack or you might kind of go in and change the data. So the bridge became this decentralized protocol. So a group of nodes would sit on a bridge and they would essentially watch for transactions on, let's say, Ethereum. And if they all agree that a transaction happened on Ethereum, then they could pull that transaction in and you know, transmit it over to Aeon. Um, and because they're, they're, they're playing that function, 
they're getting rewarded by the network for doing it essentially. So they're they're essentially being rewarded for uh, for validating cross chain information. So they they have to go and witness events on one side of the bridge, and they have to transmit it to the other side of the bridge. And if they do that according to the rules, then they get rewarded for doing that. And that you know those rules are uh, are focused on incentivizing decentralization. So the bigger the bridge, the more decentralized it is, the more people have confidence in the bridge. Um, so that's kind of the goal is that at every layer of communication, it's as decentralized as possible. So when we originally thought about it, we said, hey, if I have a whole bunch of different blockchains, you know, blockchain number one, two, three, and four, traditionally, the only way to, con to go between them was a centralized structure, right? So you can only go through an exchange to connect all these decentralized systems. Um, so you know, we said, well, actually, we want to connect blockchains with a decentralized system. So the in logically, in our mind, at least, it was if you want to connect blockchains with a decentralized intermediary, then that intermediary needs to be a blockchain also. So that's why we built Aon, right? So we built Aon to be a blockchain that connects blockchains so that the any point of intersection is always decentralized. There's going to be different types of decentralization. You're going to have like massively decentralized networks and you're going to have like less decentralized bridges, but at, at least you reduce that single point of failure concept and you try to you try to incentivize decentralization as often as you can uh, so that you know people can have confidence that when data is moving from one chain to another, it hasn't been changed or tampered with. So you, you just said, you just mentioned like big bridges. And in your white paper, you do mention that, um, let's say between um, Ethereum and Aeon 1, there's a possibility that multiple bridges will exist, right? And naturally, you have some sort of a some sort of a more market emerge. And depending on the reputation or different factors, people will uh, choose one bridge over over another um my question is do multiple bridges for the same blockchain so so, so let's say this multiple bridges connecting aeon one to ethereum do multiple yeah. bridges for the same blockchain networks do they help in scalability at all yeah they can because then you you actually you know another bottleneck in scale is the bridge right so if i'm if let's say i have let's say i have a million transactions that i want to move between aeon one and ethereum and all those million transactions are using the same bridge, then the bridge becomes one of the limiting factors, right? So opening parallel bridges actually could operate, could offer um, you know, alternative paths for that transaction to get validated. The, the original concept in multiple bridges was not that we want multiple bridges, but the market may offer different structures of bridges. And the market would offer those with different pricings, essentially. So somebody who builds a bridge does that on the Aeon blockchain on the Aon One blockchain by, by creating a bridge registry contract and, and essentially defining the rules of the bridge. And the rules of the bridge primarily are what's the fee on the bridge? How do you how do you pay for access to the bridge? And the other nodes can then join the bridge by staking tokens into that into that contract essentially. Um, but somebody else might say, well, that bridge is too expensive. And because it's so expensive, not a, not a lot of nodes joined it. So now it's relatively centralized and very expensive. So I want to build a cheaper bridge and I want it to be more decentralized. So then I go build an alternative essentially. And I could go and design kind of a separate economic system. But so for one, we wanted that free market opportunity. But two, we also want um, we also want to make sure that there's a scaling solution that, that relies on multiple bridges. So you can remove some of the bottleneck on a single bridge. If that makes sense. So when it comes to bridges, like can the bridges scale by themselves? You you talked about like a big bridge, right? You just you mentioned that like two questions ago. But like, what is the difference between a bigger bridge and a smaller bridge? Uh, just the number of nodes that are active on it. So I think I think the nodes will be attracted to bridges if there's enough transaction volume to justify significant fees on the bridge. So the fees on the bridge are are created every time a transaction crosses the bridge. So if I, if I connect Aon to like some empty blockchain that nobody uses, then there's not gonna be very many transactions going back and forth. So there'll be very little incentive for bridge nodes to participate in those bridges because there's not a lot of reward. So I think the bigger the bridge will come as a result of the more transaction volume. So the more transaction volume, the more fees and the more fees, the, the bigger the reward for these nodes. Uh, so that's kind of the basic premise. And as a full, as full disclosure, I have my money in Neon, so just I'm not trying to <laughs> shill or anything, but I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> no, and, you know, to be, to be clear, I mean, there's also there's nothing in our design that restricts a bridge from being centralized. So the design could allow for a centralized bridge, just the market might demand decentralized bridges, right? So, if, but if somebody really, really trusted decides to build a bridge and make it really, really cheap, maybe people will use that bridge, you know, and they might say, hey, I trust it enough to use it. 
But in another context, it might say, no, I don't trust anybody. I want to use the more decentralized one. And so that's where you get like a market op uh, a market opportunity where some people are going to be confident enough to say this one is somewhat centralized, but maybe it's faster. So I'm going to go on the somewhat centralized faster bridge. Or I could do the trade off and say this one might be a little slower, but it's more decentralized. I can go that way. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to like dictate that in our design. We're keeping the design kind of as flexible as possible so people can, you know, pass their transactions wherever they want. Yeah, the 10 cent, the really cheap literal and figurative 10 cent bridge versus the Tor bridge, which is really slow. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, you explained like how bridge works. And I think that like uh, IO network actually provide the opportunity uh, with various incentive as well as penalties. As especially I wonder that like, um, there is there are two types like POS and like proof of intelligence. Could you explain like both of things yeah, you mean for our consensus? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so we're, we've got two things on the consensus. One, um, our first release, which is which is like the one we're releasing this week, is a proof of work um, is a proof of work network. So we're we're releasing a a form of like kind of version one of the network that that functions off of like a modified version of the Equihash mining algorithm. Uh, and that's what's being released this week. Um, our long-term design and consensus is a delegated consensus model. And the delegation means that we have a core group of validating nodes that, that, that actually provide the infrastructure for block creation and block propagation. So that core group of nodes will be, you know, call it several hundred nodes that provide that core function. And then behind those, those validating nodes is a group of backers. And those backers are nodes that support them. So they're also active nodes in the system um, and they support a validator and they share in the reward of the validator and they can they can support them in two ways. They can support them by staking tokens or staking coins into the system or they can support them by providing a computing resource to the system. And the computing resource is what we're designing that we call proof of intelligence because we actually we're starting to think about, you know, the long term implications of being able to run uh, artificially intelligent applications on top of decentralized networks. And for that to happen, that means you need an on-chain resource that has like AI capability essentially. So we're trying to incentivize nodes to create that machine learning functionality so that they can actually be a called as a function inside of a smart contract. And this is where we start playing around at the term, are we, are we talking about smart contracts or are we shifting towards intelligent contracts where you can start building like AI features inside of contracts. Um, and, and that's like, that's part of our, our design. I'm sorry, I'm smiling because I'm watching C and laughing. But uh, um, so the um, the goal at, at some point is to say, well, the long term convergence of artificial intelligence and uh, decentralized networks is how we continue to have confidence in more increasingly sophisticated systems. So the big risk that people see in the AI industry is that you're putting so much confidence in centralized institutions to act honestly. So they're, you know, you're putting in, uh, into, you know, uh, Google and IBM and other like massive institutions that are going to be running AI infrastructure, but you have to trust that they're going to act honestly and in your best interest. So lo long term, as we prove the scale of decentralized infrastructure, we think that we can move a lot of these AI characteristics onto decentralized networks and really make sure that trust is fundamental to all of these systems, regardless of whether they're you know, smart contracts, dumb contracts, or intelligent contracts, trust is still the kind of the base layer of everything. Yeah. So, um, wow, okay. <laughs> I, I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, Aria Evenheim is like, love you, Matt. You got, you got quite the fan base there. <laughs> yeah, so I had, I had a question because, so in for Ethereum, you know, they're doing a lot of crypto economic research, right? And recently, sure. like Vitalik's famous, like, trilemma which I'm, I'm still struggling to like wrap my head around. But for you guys, to me, it seems even more complicated than like what Ethereum is suggesting. But uh, you have, you've, you've written, you've stated that you'll come up, you'll come up with some research and some papers that'll help us like kind of wrap our heads around the Aeon uh, crypto economic model. Can you just kind of give us a teaser or like, what are some trade-offs that you guys are uh, balancing in your, in your head and like for choosing both like proof of stake or proof of work, or just even in the terms of, even in the way how you have multiple incentivization schemes to uh, make, you know, to reward people. Yeah, well, you know, I, the, the trilemma concept is, is is something that we've been thinking a lot about because there is there is a trade-off in a lot of contexts in the industry around, you know, decentralization versus efficiency. Um, 
you know, and, and, and I think what we what we've kind of opted for in our design is that decentralization can happen in many ways, right? You can have decentralization of a single network, but you can also have decentralization across a number of networks. So, you know, you think of centralization in in, you know, as as contrary and as it sounds, centralization to the same decentralized network causes less and less efficiency. So if we all use the same decentralized network, then we're actually, you know, de depreciating its value because we're slowing it down and we're we're damaging its 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 performance essentially. So not only decentralizing the networks, but decentralizing the number of networks that we use, and that's kind of the core of our design. Now the crypto economic layer. I mean, we're really fortunate to follow projects like Ethereum. I mean, we look up to Ethereum with an enormous amount of respect, and we follow a lot of their their leadership in the research fields because they're leading a lot of the a lot of the really really interesting crypto economic research is coming out of the Ethereum Foundation, the Ethereum community. I think a lot of those lessons trickle down very much to us. You know, there's not there's nothing all that unique about our crypto economic design versus another multi blockchain interoperable system. You know, everybody realizes that individual networks need to have their own stable concept of crypto economics. And then we also realize that for us to connect these networks, those connections need to have a layer of crypto economics. So you need to figure out why would people participate in the connection and whether that connection is being done, um, you know, using the polka dot model with, uh, you know, the relays and the parachains and uh, or it's using Cosmos and the zones and the hubs or you're talking about Icon and the Nexus and the different the different uh, blockchains off of the Nexus or WAN chain. Everybody has a similar concept where at the connection, you need an economic model. You need a reason for people to participate in the connection. So I think we're going to learn a lot from each other. Like we're going to put out, most of our research is going to get put out in the way of like requests for comments. We want to start conversations. We don't know all the perfect and final answers. Um, but luckily, like as we progress in our, in our design, we can start to collect more and more feedback. And the reason we're really excited about like starting to grow the impact of our community is because we actually want more input from people. We don't have all of the answers internally. I mean, we're a 32, 35 person team right now. Um, and, you know, we could use way more brains on this problem. We could use way more researchers, way, way more academics. So like our, our objective is to just start opening the dialogue so that we can get better input. But we are going to be publishing some of our early, you know, thoughts on, on our economic design. We do expect that we're going to get some of it wrong, and we need people to kind of like put up flags and give us comments when they when they disagree with something that we put forward. Uh, but I spend a lot of time reading what's coming out of the Ethereum Foundation. Is like a lot of my early, um, you know, a lot of the early thinking that we do comes out of Ethereum. If I'm being honest, you you mentioned about decentralization and how you know there was recently a paper published by IC3 which talked about how these decentralized networks, namely Bitcoin and Ethereum are not as decentralized as we'd like to think. Yeah. And actually we, we can actually substitute them with like a better better system um, in terms of decentralization. But so I think a lot of public blockchain protocols are in fact more centralized than we're, we'd like to admit. Um, and you, you, kind of meant, you kind of touched on how to keep Aon decentralized. Now the question is, if the interoperability protocol is decentralized, but the blockchains connected to it are not as decentralized or they're not, is that? Do you think there's any value to the interoperability protocol? I think we're we're going into inception here. We're like six levels into the dream right now. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm just I'm just I'm just wondering because, yeah, because you you you've mentioned just now that you you will have bridges that are centralized, yeah. right? That can be more centralized than others, and it's very interesting because in your white paper, you you explicitly say that they are decentralized to a certain extent. Mm. I think I think that's the that's the wording that you use. Yeah, so, well, all this is like a spectrum, right? Like the perfect decentralized network does not exist because the perfect decentralized network is inefficient. And, and that's where we run into challenges. Like the reason Bitcoin has centralized around massive mining pools is because there's economies of scale, right? So everybody organizes itself around like efficient use of resources. So efficient use of resources, and you have to assume that that's going to be true always. Like, you know, just economic principle will dictate that if we can be more efficient, we will be more efficient. If organizing ourselves as a collective is more efficient than organizing ourselves as individuals, then we will always opt to organize as a collective. So we have to have that kind of in our thinking when we design these systems. When we designed our delegated consensus model, we had a kind of a layer of, um, you know, we call them tiers in our white paper. And these tiers are essentially like, how do you participate at different levels of reward in the consensus algorithm uh, so that you can get a larger or smaller reward? 
And the purpose of defining the size of the tier was to make sure that um, you, you were not incentivizing centralization behind a single validating node. So if, if, if everybody said, hey, I want to back the one validating node that is most likely to get the biggest reward all the time, then you'd have massive centralization behind that node. So we end up structuring these tiers so that at some point there's a diminishing return to centralization. So if you can think about your economic model to like, it's all like crypto economics is all about thinking about the behaviors you like and reinforcing them and thinking about the behaviors you don't like and like penalizing them essentially. So if you don't like centralization then think about how to economically incentivize people away from centralization. And right now, for example, if you were to take the Bitcoin protocol and say at, at a certain scale, a pool would start to receive less reward. At some point, there's a diminishing return to centralization. That, that's not how the Bitcoin protocol got designed, but it could have got designed that way, right? You could say, hey, a large pool, a large centralized pool of miners has a diminishing return the larger it gets. So now every new member I join into the pool, I reduce the overall percentage of reward that people get. So then you find an equi equilibrium of what's like the balance between efficiency and decentralization. But you have to design that into the protocol because if you just leave it up to the economic motivation of the individual, they will always opt for the most efficient, not the most decentralized. And often the most decentralized is the less efficient. So I think you have to kind of like set these rules into the protocol as much as you can. Okay, let's talk about your recent releases. So sure. I, know, I know you have to test that up now. And um, I think people should jump on that and try it, try it out for themselves. But uh, you, what were the improvements you made on the existing EVM with your fast with Aeon's fast VM? Like, like what are the specs of it? Uh, the fast VM. Uh, so, the, so again, if you look at our roadmap, you'll notice that our long term design focuses on something we call the Aeon VM, right? The AVM. So, it, it, as an interim, we ended up building kind of a modified or enhanced version of the Ethereum virtual machine that focused on you know, one, major, um, one major characteristic difference, was changing it from a 256-bit uh, uh, data word size in the EVM to a 128-bit data word size in the fast VM, in the Aeon fast VM. So completely compatible at the smart contract layer, so still supports the same uh, solidity, but allows you to run applications significantly more efficiently. So you know, less usage of gas, um, and faster execution through the VM. So that's like the major difference that we did in this changeover. So we rewrote the VM from a 256 bit to a 128 bit. Uh, and then we also ended up um, essentially designing an LLVM like just in time, um, JIT as the execution engine. So we swapped out the execution engine to make sure that we could we could process transactions more efficiently and more, more quickly essentially. So this is like an, an incremental improvement. This is not an order of magnitude improvement. This This gives us like, you know, tens of percentages improvement over the EVM and performance, but the long-term design is still to, to move towards a completely paralyzed VM uh, with the AVM design, but it's a longer, it's a significantly longer roadmap to make that happen. So that's why we ended up starting with kind of like a, you know, a small improvement as we work towards our long-term design. Why did you, so why did you choose POW, like Equihash? Some people might say having POW, you know, recently, uh, Nick Sabo and uh, Vitalik got into a little tough, like tussle in um, on Twitter over uh, POW and PO, PO, proof of stake, and which one has the better like social scalability. But some some might say have proof of work is outdated. But what do you think? Why did you guys choose Equihash? Uh, so, you know, two two reasons. One. Um, it's relatively well understood by the market and it's been proven economically by the market, whether it's the long-term design or not. I mean, we're, we're unconvinced. It's not part of our long-term design. Um, so this was really kind of a starting point in the system, right? To say, hey, we need to get something out there that the, the ecosystem understands, that miners could support, that comes out of the box with a relative amount of certainty on its security. If we were to start from complete, you know, from, from scratch going into a completely new model, we'd have to question the, the security premise from day one. So we wanted to make sure that we at least had some um, solid understanding of what we can expect in terms of security based on the, the mining algorithm that we, that we decided to support. Um, what we then did on top of that, though, is we looked at all the kind of POW mining algorithms. We landed on Equihash, uh, and then we made modifications to the Equihash mining algorithm to essentially um, to make it more ASIC resistant. So we had to like memory harden the, the, the algorithm. So, you know, ASIC resistance, you know, people throw the term around relatively frequently. It really comes down to how much memory is required to run the mining algorithm. Because 
because um, ASICs are, are pretty inefficient at storing large, vol large quantities of, of memory. So the more memory you require at the mining, then the less likely it is that an ASIC could mine that network, essentially. So we wanted it to be somewhat uh, easy for a GPU-based miner to, 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 to adjust to mine this. Uh, and, and somewhat resistant to the ASIC world kind of stepping in and, and, and overmining it, so to speak, or, or dominating the hash power with ASICs. Uh, so that's kind of our early design. We're, we're working in parallel on proof of intelligence. Um, you know, it has some similar characteristics to proof of work because you're still proving some sort of compute to the network as, you know, in anticipation of a reward. Uh, but the compute that you're working on is actually some sort of functional compute. Because a big criticism of, of, of proof of work, or one of the big criticisms, is that you're doing kind of a, you're just doing brute force math, right? You're not really solving a useful problem. You're just solving a problem to prove that you can solve a problem. And that's where we, we ended up starting to question like, well, what if we can make the problem useful so that the output of the problem was useful? Uh, so that's the kind of the, 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 the hope that we have behind our proof of intelligence design. But we still got a little bit of research and, and it's kind of in development stage right now. So it's not perfectly ready to, to release, but uh, we're getting some pretty cool results on proof of intelligence that will hopefully have uh, something to show you guys in the next little while. Um, on top of that, I wondered that like, how do you foresee POW evolving into POI? Your answer already included this a bit. Uh, what role does SOM, like your new partnership, uh, play here? Sorry, what was the first part of the question before Sam? Sorry. Oh, the first the first part of the question was how do you you kind of cover touched on uh, how how proof of work naturally evolves or changes into proof of intelligence. So yeah. if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. Uh, yeah. So I mean, two things. One, you know, one of the designs that we're working on is to make sure that the components that we build are modular enough that if you wanted to launch a new blockchain connected to Aon, you can pick up any one of our modules and use it to launch that new blockchain. So if you wanted to have a blockchain that that only relied on proof of intelligence as its core consensus algorithm, you could do that. Um, in our design, proof of intelligence becomes one subcomponent of this delegated consensus model, right? So, you know, the, 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 the cool thing about working on a on a on an interoperability project is that when we think about updating our system, we don't have to think about it as forking our system. We can say, hey, we've got version one of our network that's a live operating blockchain, and we want to launch version two. We can actually launch it as a completely parallel blockchain, and it could operate beside each other. And, and after they operate beside each other, then you can build a bridge between them. And after you build a bridge between them, you can move value over from one to the other. So you don't have to go through these like contentious forks every time you have a new proposal. And because you have that as, a, as, a, as an option, you can actually see two networks continuing to survive. You could say, hey, I've got you know, Aon version one and Aon version two operating in parallel. Our bridge design is such that the supply of our coin is stable regardless of if it's on one blockchain or two blockchains. So you know, today we've got 465 million roughly coins, many of them locked off, but that supply is all on the Ethereum network, right? Then we want to migrate that supply over to the Aon blockchain, but then we want to migrate that supply over to the next version of the Aon blockchain, we actually pl are planning for the fact that some of the supply stays behind. So you might have one blockchain with one quarter of our supply and another blockchain with three quarters of our supply, and the bridge is efficient enough to move the supply back and forth. So as long as you know that that supply is stable and it falls into the same, you know, whatever that monetary policy that, we, that, that we've created, uh, the monetary policy doesn't shift regardless of how many blockchains. So today, if you think of a single supply of a coin, it's always locked to a single blockchain. So we're trying to get a single supply to be able to exist across multiple blockchains. So that's, you know, as we update the system, we, we envision that there'll be people that like version one better than version two or version two better than version three, and they may stay behind and continue to use, you know, an older version versus a newer version. So it's not, we're not anticipating that everything has to be an all or nothing update. You know, you can have parts of the community that stay behind. Um, as it relates to SON, the relationship we're developing with SON really, really uh, is focused on how do we make um, mining of the Aon um, network in its first release available to people more efficiently through a uh, decentralized marketplace that Sonom is building. So Sonom is building this marketplace where I can put forward GPU power and somebody else can come buy that GPU power and allocate the GPU power to Aon mining, for example. And then we can prepackage an Aon miner on top of the Sonom marketplace so that you can you know, buy GPU and have an Aon miner running on top of it in like a single step. Uh, so that's kind of the, the the intent of that relationship. Yeah, uh, something I something I it, that wasn't clear to me was 
So you would have multiple versions of these blockchains, but how would each of these blockchains, uh, the different versions, how would they be secured? Is it like, is it is the concept similar to merge mining or is it all done by staking or? No, yeah, so it depends on the version, right? So version one, version one of the blockchain is, is based on proof of work, right? So proof of work will will imply that they're all, they're, they're, they're going through the Equihash mining process and providing security to the network. Um, you know, as we progress, you'll have the, the final version of the network will have a staking function as well as a validating function as well as a proof of intelligence function. Um, so between moving between these networks, the amount of coins that sit on top of a single network, our current hypothesis, and I'll say it hypothesis because we're asking the community for, for comments, we're going to be releasing in the next week or so our intended monetary policy. And our monetary policy implies that the reward on a blockchain is a percentage of the supply on that blockchain. So, um, you know, let's say we have the 465 million coins across two blockchains. The reward is stable, so a, a flat percentage, um, and but it's stable based on how much of the supply is on blockchain number one versus blockchain number two. So, if enough of the coins move over, then this then the reward on the original blockchain goes down so much that there's less incentive for miners to be there. And then more, more and more incentive for miners to shift over to the new version. But if it stays kind of balanced, then you may have miners that stay on the old version and miners that move on to the new version. Uh, so it really, the, the reward follows the supply. Um, and that's what we're trying to make uh, you know, as, as kind of a stable rule so that we can calculate monetary inflation on, a, on the basis of supply, uh, regardless of where that supply sits. Is there a possibility for a particular version of a blockchain to be completely abandoned by like either the stakers or by the miners. Yeah, totally. Yeah, there, there absolutely would be a possibility for that to happen if, if, if there was, and I don't know, completely abandoned, you know, one miner continuing to run the mining algorithm, in theory, the blockchain still exists, right? Uh, but at a certain point, you get to a, below a certain threshold of, of hash power, um, and it would, it, for all intents and purposes, it would stop becoming like a trustable system. So um, you, it probably would kind of slowly die off. And you know what we'll do as a as as a foundation is we'll kind of we'll we'll, we'll be very vocal about which networks we're 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 still in the business of maintaining, but the community can go maintain whatever they want, right? So you can go and have a network that is being maintained by another party, and that's fine. If people still see value in it, they'll they'll keep running applications on it. Yeah, it's it's very cool because it's because to me it seems like you are empowering and giving choice back to the users. Like the users have all the choices that they want and they can choose which version of the blockchain they prefer. But at the same time, it's not forceful like a soft fork, nor is it contentious like a hard fork. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, let's hey, jump you know, into like, yeah. this, this is a design that actually, having two networks operating in parallel is like is, is a cool outcome and a, and, a, and a desired outcome rather than it being a negative outcome. And you know, when you, when you go into like, the traditional design of a, of a decentralized blockchain, a fork looks like an undesirable outcome. Uh, but we're saying, hey, actually having two parallel blockchains that run the same monetary supply is, is cool, as long as you're not duplicating the monetary supply. So what you don't want is you, want, you don't want to have like a Bitcoin Cash or an Ethereum Classic situation where you've, where you've doubled the monetary supply. You want to have two parallel networks that still maintain a single monetary supply. Uh, like about that, I just wonder that like, uh, in other like interchain uh, project, including Cosmos and Icon, they describe the decentralized exchange in the their white paper. So, do you have like plan to you know like uh, decentralized exchange in your yeah, um, network? Yeah, I I think you know we've always envisioned that that's an application that would get built on top of Aon, but it's not something that we're prioritizing as a foundation. Um, we may work hand in hand with third party projects to do that. Um, but yeah, we, we do think that this is a cool protocol that could be used for decentralized exchanges. Um, you know, the, the idea of like something like Ether Delta that sits on top of Aon, but not only deals in tokens, but also deals in cross chain currencies, um, I think is a really cool concept. You know, we're, it's, we're not prioritizing product development right now. We're prioritizing like the network and the protocol. Um, so for now it's not on the roadmap, but it, you know, very well might be something that somebody decides to do, you know, with our support, but nothing in the pipeline right now. Yeah, this is gonna be a little complaint, but let's hope it's not like Ether Delta. It is better. <laughs> yeah, I uh, use it as an example, but you're not the best example. But it's the one everyone's familiar with. So it, it's true. It's true. <laughs> um, okay, questions about partnerships. Uh, this let's let's jump let's jump into uh, EEA because I know you're like a founding member, a board member. 
Um, and we'll, we'll ask the, um, the nitty gritty harder questions now. Uh, do any members of the EEA actually contribute? And as a, as an OG founding member in the EEA, what have you seen in the past months? What kind of developments have been there? So biggest development at the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is we just hired an executive director. His name is Ron Rosnick. Um, really, really uh, solid guy uh, who's going to start putting a lot more structure into kind of the priorities of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. So, um, you know, original focus, and, and I was actually, I was on the phone with Ron today talking about this. Um, original focus of the EEA started off by saying, how do we take Ethereum style code? And I say Ethereum style because people are constantly modifying it. Um, but we take Ethereum style code and we optimize it for private networks. That was like the original mandate of the EEA because the, the hypothesis was that enterprises were only comfortable working with private blockchains. So you have projects like Quorum, you had our, you know, our company when we started, Nuco was only doing private networks. Um, you know, our friends at Block Apps, companies like Monax, uh, and the list goes on and on. Um, what we're, what I'm trying to push the EEA to do is to start recognizing that um, public networks are going to become a really important part of every business, whether they're large enterprises or small startups, public networks are going to become fundamental to kind of all aspects of society in the near future. So, you know, the forward thinking companies are going to want to think about how do they integrate their systems into public networks. But we've also held the position that private networks and public networks don't need to like be mutually exclusive. I think that the, the long-term solution is that some applications and some business processes are going to be better suited for private networks not necessarily because of privacy requirements, which might be one reason, but also because of efficiency requirements. Like if you if you close off a network to a smaller group of participants, um, you know you could actually achieve significantly higher throughput and efficiency. So you might have parts of a business process in a segregated private network, and then part of that business process in a public network. And then we come back to the same problem of well, how do you connect those networks to each other? And that's where we started designing on the basis of like private and public and public and public, how do you build those connections? So the bridge concept is still the same, whether you're doing like a private Ethereum network to public Aon or you're doing public Ethereum to public Aon. Um, and we also had this kind of more contentious view that other protocols other than Ethereum were gonna have long lives, you know? So we, it wasn't just gonna be Ethereum and Bitcoin at the end of the day. We were gonna see enterprise adoption around R3 and their Corda protocol and Hyperledger. And then we're gonna see public adoption around networks like Quantum and Neo and um, you know, Definity and others, right? So we wanted to make sure that whatever we were designing was like generic enough. Now to your other question about members of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, there are a few members that are like extremely um, high value contributing members. And increasingly now there's a, there's a very robust group of like working teams that are working on different aspects of like the spec. The goal of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is to publish a spec on how do you run an enterprise network. Um, so, you know, off the top of my head, you get, we get a lot of involvement from JP Morgan. We get a lot of involvement from Microsoft, Intel, uh, Santander Bank is like massively involved in a lot of these efforts. Accenture is really, really active. Deloitte is increasingly active. Um, and like, you know, the list goes on. There's, there's 400 plus companies in there. They're definitely not all contributing on a daily basis, but I'd say like over a quarter of those companies are like actively participating in working groups and actively contributing code and actively, you know, feeding requirements into the into the structure. The Enterprise Ethereum Alliance now has not only a executive director, but it also has um, some full time staff that are working on like des are writing the spec and designing the spec. So there's some full time technical staff at the EEA that are that are kind of spearheading that with input from members. And I, you know, we're we're going through a little bit of a board shuffle pretty soon, uh, but we're we're still on the board of directors along with ten other companies, um, and and mostly it's large companies. You know, there's only three startups on the board, um, and the other eight are you know big companies like Microsoft and Intel and others. But what you just said in like like the last two minutes really made EA less enigmatic for me. Um, so it sounds to me it sounds more like a um, like a standardization body. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, you know, and we, we've, we've been having this conversation about like, what's our mission in life at the EEA? And there's definitely been different perspectives. I mean, one of the big players inside the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance is Consensus. You know, Consensus has a huge vested interest in seeing the success of Ethereum. So, you know, obviously there's a there's a mandate for Consensus that might be different than a mandate for like a bank that's got like an internal innovation team. But we're, we're kind of finding our our like our common ground. And our common ground tends to be that there's going to need to be a set of specifications on how large enterprises integrate or interact with networks, whether they're private networks or public networks. 
So some of that is focusing on privacy requirements. That's a big focus of the Quorum project. How do you do private transactions? Some of it is focused on, you know, just doing more efficient supply chain management or whatever. But I think increasingly crypto is going to become part of that conversation because now you're going to get like, you know, investment banks and, and, and you know, large financial institutions that are, that are interested enough to get access to these markets. And the EEA might very well be like their, their on ramp into that. Uh, do you expect that more and more uh, companies, including like uh, banks or, you know, like institute, financial institution will join the EEA? Yeah, um, I think so. I mean, I think I think I've got like two perspectives on this. One, I think it's like, really important that these large incumbents take this seriously. But I also think when we start, when we were talking about enterprise in our business, like since we started a few years ago, um, enterprise to me, it, everybody just assumed that when you say enterprise, you're talking about existing enterprises. Um, but I think like more exciting is like, what's the next generation of companies that's coming out of this industry, right? So. Um, then, and there's there's some like massive analogies to the internet, right? Like the earliest websites built by banks were like online brochures. They were really shitty and they didn't really do anything. And like, they just, they were like static pages, right? But in parallel to that, PayPal was building like a completely new payment system. So I'm more interested in like PayPal, the analogy to PayPal than the analogy to the bank. Like who will be the next PayPal? Who will be you know, the next Amazon on top of this system. Because the enterprises of the internet era are not the big companies from before the internet era. They're the companies that were created during the internet era. And that's why like, it's tough to realize sometimes, but we look around, like we're all friends in the industry and we know each other pretty well when we go to conferences. Like among us is the next Jeff Bezos and the next Mark Zuckerberg, right? And that's what's kind of cool is to think about like that next generation of tech companies. It's different because we're not building these massive centralized kingdoms like Facebook, but we are building like very, very relevant long-term technologies. And, you know, to be fair, 95% of us are going to fail in our attempt, but some of us will make it through and be like really, really relevant to the, to the long-term kind of adoption of this technology. I wish like Ion will be one of the pioneer for the future <laughs> of PayPal. And, um, <laughs> Next question, is that, <laughs> next question is that in the white paper, you talk about scalability, interoperability, but you do not address privacy. How do you plan to do this in the, is the relationship, is the partnership with Enigma a part of it? Um, yeah, it is. I mean, I think, so privacy, I see kind of two ways. One, um, there's the layer of privacy that says, well, I want to segregate part of my business application or my, my, my process into its own network and decide who's entitled to be on that network. So this goes back to like the concept of kind of permissioned or private blockchains. Um, and then there's the concept of like at a transactional level, I want to maintain privacy. Um, I'd say firstly, we don't want to go solve for transactional privacy because other people are solving for transactional privacy. So, you know, we're looking at the models of like ZK Snark and, you know, Monero and Dash and Quorum on the enterprise side. There's a lot of cool models for how do you maintain like transactional privacy. And we're more likely to, to kind of integrate or adopt one of those standards than to go create our own standard. Um, and we're also more likely to say, well, if we want access to privacy as a feature, we can just build a bridge between Aon and one of those private networks, right? And it, like, like Zcash, for example, and, and, and build that function to allow for private transactions on one network to connect into Aon on the other side. Um, private networks is still something that we intend to, to, to kind of encompass into our design. So if people want to use more of like um, a voting consensus protocol. So a lot of these private blockchain protocols are based on some derivative of like a Byzantine fault tolerant protocol. So PBFT or Honey Badger or Tendermint or like we built something called Nuco BFT. Um, and all of these are more like communication based like voting protocols. Um, and they allow for you to restrict who's entitled to be part of that voting, right? So you can say, well, you know, you need to restrict based on like unique node ID and only these unique node IDs are allowed to be part of the consensus. So they're the only ones who see the consensus data. Uh, so that's one layer of privacy that we're absolutely going to support. Um, it's not part of the Aon design because it really comes down to the individual network inside the Aon block, like inside this like network of many blockchains. The individual network could decide to be as private or as public as it wants to be. And uh, we want to make sure that, that our design is, you know, generic enough to encompass both. Yeah, I guess I guess the way of asking, like a way of us like thinking about that is like Cos Cosmos has a similar thing too. I, I just remember in like a podcast interview, they were talking about like how would you then shift coins from Zcash to Bitcoin, and then their answer was, well, that really depends on the network. It's not really our responsibility. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like you know, we don't control the protocols on the other side of the bridge. We just control, you know, how our protocol works and how the bridge works. But at the end of the day, we're still limited by the the functionality of the other side of the bridge. So like simple example is connecting to Ethereum is a significantly different challenge than connecting to Bitcoin because Bitcoin doesn't have this second layer kind of smart contract logic layer on top of it. So we have to think of a very different approach on connecting to Bitcoin and that's a, a you know a limitation based on the design of Bitcoin. So there's not much we can do about that. We're just going to have to optimize where we can uh, to kind of to fit those those different characteristics. Uh, I think we're slowly starting to wind down. Um, let's uh, field some, let's get some questions from the audience. Uh, so Marvelous Kids asks how much can bridge bridge builders make? Um, I guess two two factors in there. One, um, what's the fee on the bridge? How many nodes? Well, three factors. What's the fee when you build the bridge? How many nodes are sharing that fee? And how many transactions are crossing the bridge? Right? So it's some factor of those three things. Um, it, this is something that when we when we design a transaction format for like what we call an interchain transaction, the interchain transaction has to tag a fee in Aeon coins that will be then shared by the bridge validators. So the bridge that they're crossing will essentially publish its fee structure. And then when you send a transaction that is intended to cross that bridge, then you need to attach the appropriate fee. Very similar to attaching a fee to an Ethereum transaction, you know, to get picked up by a miner um, or a Bitcoin transaction for that matter. So the, it, it really depends on how heavily used is the bridge because if it's if it's really low volume then the fee might be very inexpensive just like gas prices change on a day-to-day -day basis or transaction fees change on a day-to-day -day basis um, and it depends on how many nodes are on the bridge if there's a hundred nodes on the bridge then the fee is getting shared among a hundred nodes if there's a thousand nodes it's being shared among a thousand nodes so um you know i don't i don't know that there's like a, a, a quantified like dollar figure i can give because it really depends on on those factors to your two revenue streams that people can do by like contributing work um, on Aeon is, you know, either validating Aeon bridges or by mining on Aeon One, right? And yeah. is the trade-off where, um, in on Aeon One you get more of a um, consistent return, but like like you said, on the by uh, validating Aeon bridges, it's more or less like very dynamic, and depending yeah. on what bridge is set up, you'll you'll you can get a better returns. Yeah. So the difference is that that the consensus on the on the Aeon One blockchain has a has a predictable reward. The reward on the bridge is a fee. So the reward on the bridge is paid by somebody. Like they're paying a transaction fee to cross the bridge, but but participating in consensus, you're getting new mint, you're getting new minted coins from the protocol. So that is always consistent. You know that monetary policy that defines how that works never changes. So the same amount of reward is going to be created on a block by block basis, or day by day basis, or year by year basis. Um, but the bridge, if nobody's using it, there's no fees to earn. If everybody's using it, there's lots of fees to earn. So it's a lot more dynamic. Another question is, what are key differences between Aeon and Arc? Um, so I haven't spent enough time looking at, at Arc uh, other than kind of surface level to really give like a, a, a well-defined answer. I know that there's been a few commentaries that have been written online about the, you know, the comparison between the two. Um, I think honestly, I'll, I'll probably pass on the question just because I don't think I'll do them a fair representation. I'll, I'll say I, I met the Arc team in uh, in Miami a couple weeks ago, and they were like phenomenal guys. Um, and we're we're you know hopefully we're going to start the conversation of working a little bit more closely together. But I, I don't know enough about their design to to comment. Okay, um, you know another question that we actually got from our audience is actually from our Korean audience. This guy uh, typed in a very long response about like Aeon the game. <laughs> and he was like, he thought we were uh, interviewing them. I don't know if he was trolling or if he thought we were interviewing the founders. And he, it was just like a very like heart wrenching. Like I love your game, and I I don't know like what you guys did with the game, but I really want to play it. And I, I was gonna read that question, but I figured like you never play that game. <laughs> it comes up all the time. Every time anybody searches Aeon, they'll probably see some cool knights with swords and. <laughs> I heard. I heard. It's also a problem in the Korean community. Um, your uh, your community manager was telling me that because the uh, the name on um, I think the Kakao group or the tele Telegram group was just like Aeon. People would come in and start asking about the game, and so they had to change it to Aeon cryptocurrency, and then people stopped coming. But with with that with that, like, how's your presence in Korea? How's it going in Korea for you? Um, we could do better, and we're gonna be, and that's why we're coming in April. We want to do a big event in April. 
Uh, we're working on um, we're working on lining up kind of all the major pieces of being like a relevant part of the Canadian ecosystem. So uh, wallets and exchanges, and then meetups and partnerships. Uh, we've got a really good relationship with Icon. Uh, we've known those guys for for a number of years. Uh, we continue to work really closely together. Um, but we do want to come. We're going to be there at the beginning of April, and we're hoping to you know get as many people out as we can. So uh, it's on it's on the priority list, but it's not something that that has gotten as much emphasis as it probably should have. You recently announced the alliance with Icon and OneChain. What does this alliance mean to Ayun? Um, so that was, you know, and, and that kind of stems back because a lot of people have asked us, you know, why those two and not other projects of interoperability. A lot of it stems back to just relationships that we've had for a number of years. Like I've known Min Kim, one of the founders of Icon for, for several years. Uh, Jack Liu at, at Wenchain and Dustin Byington, we've known for a long time. Uh, and we just realized in talking to each other that we were approaching very different problems, but we were kind of approaching them with similar solutions. Uh, so the, the more we could share and open our notes and you know share research, the better we felt about the output. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm constantly trying to reinforce internally is whenever we can leverage work that's already being done somewhere else, it's more efficient, right? We don't want to go and reinvent the wheel on every layer of our infrastructure. So there's some layers of our infrastructure where we're going to be better off kind of working with other other companies. Uh, so the first layer was kind of cross-chain communication. Icon and Wanchain both have like very interesting designs that we want to learn from. Uh, the second layer that we're starting to talk about is a collaboration on our VM design because there's a lot of projects working on new types of virtual machines. Uh, and if we can get to some sort of acceptable standard on like high performance virtual machines and decentralized networks, we're better off doing that as a group rather than everybody going and designing their own and like having no compatibility between them. So like general premise is if we can collaborate with others, we will, because it saves us some effort, makes us you know more efficient in getting to market faster. All right, I have another question about the partnership. Where is the partnership with Bancor going? Other partnerships? Yeah, so Bancor, uh, two things with Bancor. One, um, you know, we're we're really interested in their in their relay design. Uh, we're likely going to be doing a Aon to BNT relay uh, with the Bancor team pretty soon. Um, I, I think it's a cool concept to have this like self managed liquidity pool of of, of coins to trade. But the other thing that Bancor kind of came to us with was the fact that they wanted the BNT token to be um, freed from only one blockchain. They wanted the BNT token to be able to move across multiple blockchains. So we're looking at how do we leverage our bridge design to help the BNT token move across blockchains so that they could rebuild the, the, the Bancor relay on more than one network. Because uh, right now they're restricted. The only thing they can do with the BNT or with the Bancor relay is they can only do ERC20 tokens on top of Ethereum, right? So they and they want to they want to broaden that so that this this BNT pairing they can do with any coin across any blockchain. So we're we're hoping that the design that we're working on is something that they can leverage for that. Uh, but in the short term, you can expect to see like an Aon BNT uh, relay pair. Yeah. Okay. We'll have we'll have uh, one more question from the audience. Cool. Uh, Someone, someone is asking like, what your thoughts on the current BTC market correction and how it's impacting altcoins? Um, well, yeah, no, it's a good question. I mean, we every project in this industry has a lot of money caught up in the market, so it's it's obviously it's it's we're we're we're, we're paying close attention, um, but it doesn't change what we have to do on a day to day basis. So we have this conversation almost daily with the team. Like, if we're trading at ten cents or hundred dollars, you know, our roadmap doesn't change. So. Um, we need to continue hiring engineers. We need to keep building the roadmap. We need to keep researching the unanswered questions of our design, um, and that will always be true. So, you know, we it, it's sometimes more encouraging when the price is higher and discouraging when the price is lower. But it, you know, fundamentally, it doesn't change what we what needs to be accomplished. We're building something that we think is really relevant five to ten years from now. So that patience, there's going to be a lot of ups and downs in the next five to ten years. So, and and I'm constantly reiterating this to people that follow our project, like. There are some apps out there that their token might show value very, very quickly, and the use case might show value very, very quickly. There are some protocols that need time to, to develop and evolve. And, and we're going to have versions of our protocol in market used by people very quickly. Like we've got our network going out this week, and we'll have it live in the next few months. Um, but the long-term design of what we're doing is a very long roadmap. So have patience. It's how we're trying to operate. It's you know sometimes difficult to, to disconnect from the market. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it, going back to that internet analogy I was using earlier, 
the, the best companies that came out the other end of the dot-com bubble are the ones that that had that long-term view, right? So they, you, you know, Amazon got caught up in the dot-com bubble just like everybody else did, but they still stood at the end of the day. Google got caught up in the dot-com bubble and still stood at the end of the day. So I don't think it's a matter of like, where's the price in the market? It's really a matter of like, are you staying true to what your your, your goal is? And uh, are our goals farther out than, you know, day-by-day -day movements of Bitcoin? Uh, the other thing that we have to work on pretty consistently is I, I want to redefine what it means to be a coin in this market. Like right now you've got Bitcoin, Ethereum and altcoins, right? Everybody gets bucketed into this one category. But the reality is there's a lot of differences in these projects. So we're trying to make sure that we're defining well enough what it is we're doing and what are our like KPIs? You know, what should people be measuring us on? So that you don't just measure the market as one giant lump sum, you measure individual projects on their individual merits. Um, and I think over time we'll get better at that. Right now, we're obviously we get stuck in these these ups and downs of the Bitcoin price and the Ethereum price. Um, but you know we'll stand on our own two feet at some point. Yeah. What I what I think is like you said. What I like all the every single coin has a different proposition. There are a lot of coins which have like, you know, it's kind of like dating, no proposition. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's kind of like dating girls. Um, like you have girls who really stand out, and then you have the ones that are like dime a dozen. <laughs> yeah, they all look, they all look fine, but like it's like fine in like a defined manner. But yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, yes. So I think that's all the time that we have for today. Anyways, um, cool, Matt. Thank you uh, for joining us. Or yeah, it's just every time I get I get school so much whenever I talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, and I uh, really yeah. Especially like I truly agree with. The, your opinion that like there is no KPI for evaluating the each project and there will be more and more you know research and uh, um, like people's uh, interest in uh, developing you know appropriate uh, evaluation for you know like evaluating uh, the real value for the each project yeah yeah I totally agree and I think it's important it's important for us to be able to to tell our own story and not just get caught up in like the crypto market because the crypto market is a very broad story, but individual projects have very specific stories. And I think, you know, we all need to get better at that because right now an outsider looking in just sees one massive bubble or one massive, like very difficult to understand thing. But if you look project by project, you find like really, really interesting concepts, right? You find really interesting technical designs, but you have to, you have to look deeply. If, if you just look at the surface, there's no difference between coin number one and coin number 10. They all look the same to the average kind of like outsider. Mm -hmm. uh, give us uh, your social media handles. How can people get more information about Aeon? Uh, so that's a good question. Um, I, I want to make sure I don't screw this up because there's a couple of scam accounts out there that you should be aware of. Um, so, I mean, website, pretty simple, aeon.network. Um, we've got a telegram chat for, uh, for most people that are kind of, that want to participate in like an English speaking channel. We also have a Korean telegram channel and a Korean cacao channel, um, that you can get access to. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, Matt Spoke, M-A-T-T-S-P-O-K-E. Um, Aeon on Twitter is at Aeon underscore network. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other channels. I mean, we've got an active blog. We've got the Aeon network subreddit. Um, we've got a forum published now, uh, forum.aeon.network. And more and more, we're trying to push people to our GitHub. I mean, we just started publishing on our public GitHub over the course of the last few weeks. So we'd love to get some feedback and, and kind of reactions from the community. Yes, sir. Um, thank you once again, Matt, for joining us. Thanks so much, guys. Looking forward to seeing you in Seoul. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone who's who's tuned in. And once again, this is uh, your your man of the hour, seeing the Bitman and Matt Matthew, <laughs> money making Matthew. Yeah, yeah. money making right. Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> All of our special yeah. guest, uh, Mr. <laughs> Matthew Spoke, representing Aeon. Thanks so, a lot, guys. Yeah, if you if you like this video, please uh, subscribe. Uh, like and comment below if you have any like questions and stuff. I'll I'll make sure to send you either along. Like please go over to Aeon and ask, or we'll make sure to relay them along to Matt. And uh, we we hope to see well all of our audiences in the future. And also Matt, <laughs> we'll hope to see you in April. Sounds good, guys. All right, bye bye. See ya. <laughs>